We want to welcome you this morning to the intercession called entitled How We Look. And it's an intercession that we're going to get a chance to explore our music, our dress, other things about our activity that it's, it's not only how we view ourselves, but more importantly, how those outside of our activity view us. And this gives us a forum to talk about that a little bit, um, discuss the impact on our activity, if there's something that should be done or if there's nothing that should be done or whatever. And, and I think this is an interesting topic at this juncture of our activity. Many of you know that we, we are at a crossroads in our activity and, uh, and may need to tweak a few things down the line. And we're in the process of doing just that and have been for a number of years. My name is Mike Seastrom, and uh, once again, welcome to the 34th Annual Call It Out Convention and the session, How We Look. There are some handouts on the side there. There uh, are two of them that are being circulated. One of them we may be out of already. But uh, the other one, I think we've got, we had about 80 copies of that. We hopefully have enough chairs. If you don't have chairs, there's chairs right across the hallway. We can bring them on in. And that should tend to take care of things. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. All right. Very good. One of the nice things about being moderators is that you have panelists. And the panelists that we have with us today uh, are, um, are distinguished. And I'm really happy to have these panelists participating. We also have uh, Roy Gata, who is Betsy's husband. He will be running the... Yeah, running the microphone around. So I'm going to ask you again, as was reiterated this morning, if you if you make a comment, and we would love to have you make comments, please make them on the microphone. Even if it's a quick question that pops into your head, bring it up. Just step up, jump up on the microphone, state your name, where you're from, and let's get the question on the microphone because most of you that have listened to tapes and CDs and MP3s of previous sessions know those gaps in there that, that uh, you're wondering just what went on. And so we're... We, yeah, we want to, we, as Betsy said, we have a lot of answers. Sometimes we miss the questions. So we want to put those forward and, and get those out there. Uh, we started this session, I believe this is the second year in a row that we've done this session. And Betsy was the moderator last year. I believe Mike Hogan and, and myself were panelists uh, at that time. And we, we discussed the previous, the previous research that had been done by Caller Lab about how others view our activity. And Mike Hogan, being a marketing person, gave a really unique uh, perspective of how our, our activity and how others view our activity and what the impact is uh, on that. It was, it was an excellent presentation. I would recommend that uh, if, you, if you are looking for this type of additional information, you might contact Convention Tapes International. I'm sure they have the tapes of, or the uh, CDs of last year's session. Um, our first panelist that uh, we're going to introduce is Betsy Gata, and, and Betsy has been square dancing since she was five years old and, uh, and calling since she was 14. She uh, calls for beginner parties. She does classes. She does club dances um, from basic all the way up to C3. She's a caller lab accredited caller coach. She serves as vice chairman of the caller training committee, and she's also a member of the caller lab board of the governors. And one more important thing is Betsy Gata was awarded the caller lab milestone award last year at uh, our caller lab convention in North Carolina. So how about a nice hand for Betsy Gata? Thank you. One, two. Thank you, Mike. Now, Caller Lab has done a lot of market research, and we're trying to, trying to figure out how we can attract people to our activity. Those of us who square dance a lot or on a regular basis know and think that we have the absolute best activity in the world. We do not understand why people don't just flock to us, beat down our doors to come and join us. We, what do we have? We have physical exercise. We have mental st stimulation. We have a social event where, you know, instead of being on the Internet where you could meet somebody who lies through their teeth all, about who they really are, you meet people face-to-face -face and you can tell whether they're not they're nice, nice people or whether maybe that's the one you want to stay away from. We have all of those aspects in one activity. People in the United States today are looking for exercise. There's all this talk about who is overweight, who is obese. We need to exercise. I cannot understand myself personally why people would choose to walk around the mall in a circle to exercise when they could come and join us and walk in a circle with other people. I don't understand it. But obviously, they choose to do the mall walk. 
uh, I think that the, the polling said that we had a good image among the people who were polled. But I think what that good image is, is they think about family values and the good old days and the, you know, when things were simpler. And that means that they are too sophisticated for our activity. They think that our activity would not appeal to them because they see older people, funny clothes, a rural country stereotype, and no offense to any of the people who are in the rural portions of, of any country, but in my area, a rural country stereotype is not what anybody wants to have. I come from, from northern New Jersey. I'm 45 minutes south of New York City. Nobody in our area wants to think of themselves as a, a country person, and I'll get into that. And especially suburban and urban areas, we need to get away from that image. If you are in an area where that image is not uh, something that people would look down on, then you may have less of a problem. About I was uh, calling for a square dance club that does a Memorial Day parade every, every Memorial Day or right around that time, depending on where it falls. And we've done this for several years. They parade along. They square up when the parade stops. And I play music continuously. And I've made a parade disc. And the parade disc has specifically all of the patriotic songs, you know, like Grand Ole Flag, um, God Bless America, all the patriotic songs, and then since Memorial Day is the start of the summer season, and since in New Jersey the shore is huge, uh, I do all the old uh, summer songs, you know, Yellow Polka Dot Bikini and, and um, Roll Out the Lazy, Hazy, crazes, Crazy Days of Summer, and all that is on my disc. It's all singing calls, and I just play this music continuously. And there is pretty much no country music on the disc. So we get to the parade... Um, where you're, yeah, thank you, dear, the viewing stand. We get to the viewing stand. There's two nice young men in, in, in coats reading a printed blurb that the gentleman who set up the parade had given them about who are the dancers and what they do and what the, that they square dance. And at the end of this, the, at the end of this nice blurb, the, one of the guys went, yee-haw! For the tape, that was a visual of a hand scratching a blackboard. I had a headset microphone on. And my response, which may or may not have been polite, was, I'm from New Jersey. I don't yee-haw a lot. And then we hit the button for Grand Ole Flag and, and did side space Grand Ole Flag for the reviewing stand. It was like I wasn't going to let them reinforce the stereotype that I have been working for years to get away from. So... What can we do to blast the stereotype as callers, as leaders, as square dancers? Part of it is the dress code. And I'm going to address, I know that there are people in square dancing who love the frilly clothes. I know that there are women who love to get dressed up in skirts. I know that there are women in this society who don't own a skirt and wouldn't buy one if you paid them. Those people are never going to get into to square dancing as long as you have a really strict dress code. And one of the problems is that, well, let's talk about what's in fashion right now. You go into a, a store right now, what do you see still? And it's been fashionable for a couple of years. Yep, she had it. The tiered broomstick skirts, the flared skirts that are now acceptable in the square dance world as, quote, prairie skirts, unquote. And... Why don't we demonstrate in those clothes because they're already in the store and we take advantage of the fashion? You can send people out to buy square dance clothes in the local TJ Maxx if you have one. Uh, that's a, a discount store for those of you who don't know. Walmart, thank you. Same principle. You, all those clothes are available right now. Um, we, a lot of times people go out to demonstrate in their frilliest skirt with their shortest, you know, their Floofy is crinoline, and it's not what people are going to see themselves doing. We've relaxed the dress code, but that's not, you know, that one of the thing, things is that if you have a relaxed dress code, say it's a casual night, and somebody chooses to wear a skirt and chooses to wear a square dance skirt because they like it, you should not be, you should be tolerant of that. You should not be going, oh, don't you know that's casual? How come you wore that? 
You know, well, that's what you get. You get the people who, who don't like the square dance clothes, and all of a sudden they're putting down the people who do. We should be tolerant and let the people wear what they are comfortable wearing. If you want to wear a long skirt, that's great as a female. If you actually, well, I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, if you want to wear a short skirt with a crinoline as a female, that's great. If you want to wear pants, and they're nice pants, and, and you can move in them and you're comfortable, I don't see anything wrong with it if you can get the square dance clubs to relax the dress code. Uh, and to get in, uh, one of the things I have on my handout is relaxed dress codes are not the be-all, end-all. I dance with a modern, what they call a modern urban con- contra dance group, what I used to call a traditional contra dance group. They dance contras, they dance to live music, they swing like, some of the dancing that we saw last night would be what they would be doing. Uh, they dance for about two and a half hours, there's one 20 minute break in the middle. They walk through each dance, and they, s- they have no dress code, and they still have to work at recruiting. And when I was all of a sudden said, I'm not get into that, there are a couple of, of guys there who have decided and they, they've they decided that the women get all the fun because the skirts twirl and they miss that. So they'll come in their pants and they bring a skirt so they can twirl. <laughs> and they are not part of the of the gay square dance picture or the gay contra dance picture. They're simply straight people who think that twirling skirts are fun. And I think the twirling skirts are fun. I like to dance in a skirt. But what we need to do is be tolerant of other people's likes and dislikes. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a there's a woman who's danced with me at a senior center program, and she's take, now taking mainstream lessons. But she will probably not ever go out to a square dance club unless she's allowed to wear slacks. She doesn't own a skirt. But she's danced with me for four years. Excuse me. <clears throat> Music. How we look is, is also how we sound. When we go out in public, how do we present our activity? I know, I know from my experience and what people say to me when I say, why don't you come out and square dance? I know what the image is. And the excuse I get is, uh, a hundred thousand times is, well, I don't like country music. Well, square dancing is not limited to country music. We use a variety of music. That's not the image in the public mind. What we need to do as callers, anytime there are people observing our square dance, Maybe we have to change our program and choose a different piece of music so that we, you know, maybe we had a country tune picked out. Maybe we need to change it and do something else while that person's watching and then use a country tune. And maybe they'll hear that there are two types of music there or three, depending on how long they stay. Same, same thing with this parade. I was talking with a, a gentleman at home and telling him about my parade disc. And he says, oh, I wish so-and-so would do that. We do a parade with, with him, and he always plays Turkey in the Straw. And we said, so-and-so, why do you play Turkey in the Straw? And he says, because that's what the people expect. I don't want to give the people what they expect. Because what they expect is not what we know we have. We know we have a vastly different product from what they think we have. And we need to somehow communicate that to them. So, so when I'm in public, I use a variety of music whenever possible. When I do, I do beginner parties, uh, what they used to call one-night stands, party dances. I work in schools. When I do that, I play music that I think will suit the, the audience to the best of my ability. Now, there is no way on earth that I have music that will be, quote, modern that some of the kids are listening to. I know that. But I also know that a lot of people who are young, young, younger, say in high school or whatever, do listen to classic rock. I watch when they come in the gymnasium when I'm presenting in the high school, and, and I see people wearing a Beatles shirt or an ACDC shirt or, or whatever, and I know that, I, that they will relate to some of the classic rock pieces I have, at least better than what they would do for some of the country stuff. But that's what they're expecting. And I, I told Mike earlier... One of my most precious moments from the high school gig that I've done is we started off, and I had ju- just that year gotten a good recording of uh, old-time rock and roll. 
And the, the singing call starts with a piano riff that I have on Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band CD. And it repeats it. And I'm standing there waiting to say circle left, and the piano goes, da 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 and then it repeats, da 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 And I heard from the floor somewhere a female voice go, that's not country. <laughs> I got a light turned on. Maybe that person will never join a square dance club, but now they have possibly a different image, and that was part of my goal. Strategies to attract new people. Now, we're always worrying about we're worrying about how to attract folks into our activity. We're all getting older. Those of us who started as kids are, you know, have been dancing for mm, years, and we've gotten older. And it still beats heck out of the alternative. Getting older is still better than the alternative. The only alternative I know to getting older is to pass away. So, but we need to, se- we need to select perhaps a realistic tar- target group. People say, oh, we need the real young people. Well, if you get the real young people... That's great, and we will have them for a while. Some of them then may have to leave the activity to get on with their life. They may be married. They may be raising kids. They may have to finish getting an education. But if you get the young people really young, they will come back. I met my husband when he was in college when his girlfriend brought him to the square dance club on campus. They broke up first. Before, before he even dated me, yes, before I married him. <laughs> Roy is looking innocent. So, but the point being, the club was called the Rutgers Promenaders, and I still get sightings now from people who used to dance at Rutgers, and they're, they're, their kids are now older, and they're, they got back into the activity, and the, I'll get somebody coming up to me and say, I had somebody come out to our class and they started six weeks late and they caught up in in like three more weeks. But they said they danced with you back when they were in college at Rutgers. And it's a site that's a former promenader. And I'll get get those people coming back into the activity. Uh, But we need to, to... Look for a realistic target group. We work with the young people. We may not keep them. If we try and attract, say, 30-year-olds, 30-year-olds have kids. In today's society, that is not necessarily a practical target group. Why? Because the kids have 47 different activities each week. They don't have transportation to those activities, and the parents don't have time for themselves because they're busy ferrying the kids from here to there and back again. So perhaps 30 is not the group we're looking for. Maybe we're looking for people in their late 40s where the kids are older and have a driver's license. And the parents are going, oh, good, I got time for me. What can I do? Oh, yeah, I'm married to you. We need to do something together. (laughs) But seriously, and there are also a lot of older people who are perhaps afraid of kids or are, are not don't wish to socialize with children. We had people in our area, a gentleman came out to our club, which is still Rutgers Promenaders, but no longer on campus. And he and his, he was divorced. He used to square dance. He wanted to get back into it. He and his nine-year-old daughter wanted to take lessons. All of the clubs he called in northern New Jersey except us wanted him. Not the nine-year-old daughter. We took them both because we have, we have kids, the people who grew up and uh, who danced in college and, and had families and continue to come, we enabled them to bring their kids. We changed our dance night from a weeknight to a Sunday afternoon. We have a place on the corner where basically the kids can play you know, in one of the back corners. We changed the group to adapt so that we could keep these people. But not every group can do that. Not every group has people who started in their 20s and kept dancing. So we need to target a realistic age group. I think in today's society, square dancing is hard to learn. It requires a major commitment. There are so many people who have so many other commitments, they barely have time to breathe. We need to change how we approach recruitment. You can't have one open house and say, okay, sign on the dotted line for 30 weeks lessons. It doesn't work. We 
tried it and tried it and tried it. I believe that we need to figure out ways to have regular dances that are a limited number of basic calls, where we can teach them a certain number of calls and dance them all night with those calls. Now, what does that require of callers? That requires callers to do work. Yes, I heard it. We need to do our homework and be able to move the people without 69 calls of the mainstream program or 53 calls of the basic program. You need to be able to do that. And there are seminars and have been seminars on how to do beginner parties. Cal Campbell's presentations on on beginner parties include a lot of other things that are line dances and square dance related, but they also include how to move people with seven basics and give them a good two and a half hours of dancing. Callers need to learn that. Uh, There is a group in... Westchester, New York area, that's just north of New York City, called Dragonwood. And it's a public square dance where they have no destination. They simply have people, once a month I think it is, they have people come out and it's an open square dance. And square dance club people will come there and support it, but also you get people in off the street. If you give them enough taste of of something, then maybe they want to actually commit. What do you see when there's a new product if you go into the grocery store? Isn't there somebody behind a table giving out samples? We need to give out samples continuously, not once a year. We need to have these open dances maybe once a month. No one caller can do that because it's not cost effective. But if the Caller's Association has money, if they can get a grant from somewhere, if they can figure out how to get some money and they pool together, they can rotate callers. So you have a dance once a month. Uh, there's a program which some people have published uh, called the ABC program where there's a core group of calls and then if you call, it's like Chinese, old Chinese menu, one from column A, one from column B, and one from column C. You use the core group of calls each time and then there's five calls from in column A and then maybe the next month you'd use the five calls from column B with the core group and then the next month with five calls from column C. So if somebody came to each open dance, they wouldn't get the exact same dance. They'd get a slightly different dance. If somebody came out to one dance, they would only have to learn that column that night. The, it's published on the Internet, and I have a copy for people to look at of the call list. But you need something like that. Target, if you can, target families. The, the homeschoolers sometimes, you can, you can get them because they need a phys ed requirement. But you also need to have a place for them to dance. There are a lot of the club. I, I heard a horror story from one club. Basically, they had all these homeschoolers come out, but the you had to be 18 to join the club. Guess what? They didn't make an exception. They were totally inflexible. Every one of the parents who danced with those kids and the kids left because there was no place for them. So we need to be flexible. Personalized square dancers. Now, what do I mean by that? In further north of me in New Jersey, there are two or three clubs who are this year having better classes than than they've had in five years. And I think one of the things that happened for them was that there was one guy in a square dance club who works for a newspaper. He wrote an article. In that article, he quoted people and how they talked about square dancing activity. And say the article might say, uh, Mike Seastrom, age such and such, dentist. Justin, what's your last name? Russell, age 18, student. Every person quoted, they gave an age, and there was a variety of ages, and they gave an occupation or a former do- occupation. Uh, there was one man who was, uh, you know, 70-something, retired school administrator. What that does for me, a lot of people, when they have the rural image, and uh, please, no offending, no offense to anybody rural, because I know this is a stereotype and it's not real, but some people think rural, farmer, hick, uneducated, dumb, all in one circle. I know it's not true. You know it's not true, but... That's what their image is in their mind. That's what their mindset is. This article personalized square dancing, so somebody reading it went, oh, look, there's a person who works in computers and square dances. Maybe I could enjoy this activity. 
And the, after that, there were people starting to come out to some of these clubs after that article appeared. It's a, it's a shame. It, it occurred to me there was an obituary recently. A friend of mine died, and the man was brilliant. Uh, do I, did I bring it? Well, he was brilliant. He, he was an engineer, and they listed all the things. Here it is. Uh, he was an associate professor at Yale University, um, worked for the Institute of Defense Analyses in Princeton, worked on balanced incomplete block designs, and was wor- known for his work on alternating sign matrices. And he also was president of the New Haven Square, uh, Chess Club and a challenge square dancer. Well, you know, that's a shame it came out in the obituary, but... <laughs> But the point being, if you personalize it, somebody with that, I mean, I don't even know what that stuff was that he did. And I do have a college degree. I have not a clue. But boy, does it sound impressive. And if you could get people, when they're talking about square dancing, get the folks in doing the interview to include, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a, you know, I'm a dentist. I'm a plumber. It doesn't all have to be the, the professional activities. You want the variety. I'm a truck driver. So that you get the people who say, oh, well, I'm like him. I could come and square dance. Another way is to be visible. And not visible, say, as a square dancer. We have had some, well, we've been trying to do publicity in New Jersey. We have nine minor league baseball teams. And my husband is a big baseball fan. So we have done a couple of outings where you buy a group ticket to a, a baseball game. They put your name on the scoreboard. They announce you. If you buy enough, you can do a demonstration. If you, if you, you know, the year we didn't have enough, but we had close to enough to do, to do a demonstration, they brought a whole group of us down to help sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. They announced Square Dance Council of New Jersey again. They announced it like four times. Roy got to throw out one of the opening pitches. Roy got it from the Square Dance Council of New Jersey. And we got them to say square dancing was the state folk dance of, of New Jersey in one of the announcements. So it made us all visible. And what we told people was it's a ball game. Wear your shorts and T-shirts. But if you have a T-shirt that says something about square dancing, wear that. And we had little uh, cards with, if you're interested in information about square dancing, call this number. And we took playing cards. And, and on the face of the playing card, we put the, we, it was like, um, you know, self-stick elastic, like a badge. You know, like a hi, hello, my name is, but you, Mailing say? Mailing. Mailing labels. We used mailing labels, printed this stuff on the mailing label, put them on a card, because you can put it in your pocket. You hand somebody a flyer, what do they do with it? If you hand somebody a card, they'll stick it in their pocket without thinking. And then they stick it, they reach in their pocket and go, oh, yeah, I remember those people. Maybe I'll call. Okay. When we talk about our activity, what do we stress? We talk about, a lot of people talk about the programs, and they still call them levels. And they talk about the lessons, and they still call them lessons rather than continuing dances. And they, talk, they don't talk about what I think we should talk about, which is it's a major stress relief to go to a square dance. All, you, all the problems in your rest of your life have to go away because you cannot concentrate on what you have to do and worry about your problems. You, you cannot. Your biggest problem is what in the heck should I, I have done and which is my left hand? Well, they're still looking. <laughs> Exercise, both mental and physical. And if you're talking to an older group, say, you know, all those puzzle solving that's been published, puzzle solving stimulates the brain and that helps you perhaps delay any onset of Alzheimer's. And you don't want to talk about that to the 30-year-olds or the 40-year-olds, but if you're getting the 50 or 60-year-olds, some of us are worrying about that. And you have... <laughs> What? <laughs> and you have a humongously wide group of friends. Recently, we were talking to somebody who used to square dance, and he, he was a retired caller, and he just said, oh, you're going to Caller Lab? And I said, yes. He said, I just happened to be browsing on the Internet, and I looked up the Caller Lab. I just happened upon the Caller Lab website. Just happened. He was missing it. And I said to Roy, I said, he's missing this, and he's missing the circle of friends because you have this humongous number of people that you know. If you go out and play cards, what do you, how many people do you play cards with? Maybe four couples? That's it. 
If you go bowling, you've got your bowling league, and probably you're only really friends with the folks on your team because you've got to beat the other people. So we have an amazing group of, of friends and a network, and those are the things that we should be stressing. Okay, I think that's enough of me for a while. Thank you, Betsy. Um, I, I guess we could open up to comments, but what I'd like to do is go continue with our other panelists, and, and we'll move a little bit farther along, and then we can go and have some comments from here. Our, uh, our next panelist is a, a caller by the name of Justin Russell. Justin's been, uh, been calling for about five years now. He's uh, 18 years old. He goes to college at uh, the University of Memphis, and he calls for two clubs in his area. So let's have a nice stand for Justin Russell. Well, thank you. I want to thank Mike for letting me be on the program and actually get what a, a youth perspective because we disagree a lot on how we look and uh, come from a different point of view because uh, I was still in high school at the time when I started uh, to square dance. The, the big problem with square dancing is people don't understand who we are and they don't understand when I talk to another caller you know, what we're talking about. Uh, the best story, when I was 14 years old, uh, I didn't tell anybody that I was a square dancer, that every Thursday night was just a family night and I couldn't do anything with them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> can't go to the movies, family night. Uh, but I square dance on Thursdays. Um, so one time, uh, when I just started calling, and mom came home, I was playing basketball in the front yard with some friends. The garage door goes up, she comes in from work, the garage door goes down, and we keep on playing. Not two minutes later, she comes back, and she says, Justin, if you're going to play with the dolls, put them up when you get done. <laughs> which, <laughs> which if, you, if you're a square dance caller, you know it's the checkers for choreography, but to 14-year-old guys, they don't understand... And, and so that was, that was the ratting out of me on square dancing. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and another problem that I have, when we, the club that I call for is a casual club, uh, you wear anything you want. Uh, the local area is pretty tolerant of casual clothes. But the problem is when we do demos, we think we have to get all dressed up. And in fact, they, they tell you to get dressed up. They don't want casual clothes. But the problem with that is there's, there's two ways to do, ex or to do demos. One is when you're going to recruit people, and the other is like an exhibition. And in my mind, uh, as an exhibition, you're, you're there to show off and you're there to entertain, and then everybody goes home. But when you're trying to recruit, you want other people to say, hey, I can do that, or that looks like fun. But the problem is, or this is just my opinion, that when – we get there and we're all dressed up in our square dance clothes that they don't feel like they can be a part of it. And so when I do demos now, I try to make sure that they can be a part of it and to really don't dance and show off for them, but pull them up and make them a, a part of the whole demo. Um, I've seen that that's a higher re retention rate for the dancers. Uh, When I do one-night parties or one-night stands, party nights, uh, I know what they're expecting when I get there. They're, they're expecting my Western clothes. They're expecting the Western music. So I start off with that, and uh, I give them what they think square dancing is. But then I, I, as the night goes on, try to show them a different part of square dancing, the, the modern part of square dancing with the different types of music. Um, and I just try to showcase everything because we do have a history, and we do need to cherish that tradition, but at the same time, I don't want to do it the whole night. I want to show that square dancing is evolving as everything else is. Mike Jacobs' daughter. Christy Jacobs. A couple years ago, uh, for the youth committee, she did an interview with uh, local square dancers that were teenagers. And it was really fascinating for most older callers to see what they thought or what youth thought the better songs were, uh, what they figured would be the best song choices. Do you have me hooked up? Is it going to be really loud? Okay. And here's a couple of them.
This is an old Hank, Hank Williams song, Kalijah. This made the list. Teenagers like this song. You know why? Not because it's it's new by any means, but because it has an awesome beat. It has a really great beat, and that's what we really like. Now, to do this song all night, you know, it would get on teenagers' nerves because, you know, we're just like anybody else. We don't want the same thing over and over. We want a variety. And here's another song. I can find it. Here's another song that we like. This is a more of a modern song. But it still has that beat. We just love that beat. <laughs> here's, an, here's another one that you probably wouldn't think would make the list. Uh, two times. Elvira, everybody knows this one. Teenagers like this song. Why? Because it has a good beat. It's upbeat. We were doing a dance. Um, I was at a dance, and I think it was in Oregon. And by the end of the night, I was so sick of techno music that I just wanted something peaceful. I wanted something relaxing. So teenagers don't want just the same thing. They want a variety, just like everybody else. You know, we keep on talking about how to get people in, how to get people in, how to recruit. But how are we treating the dancers once they get in? Um, it, when I first started to dance, I, I loved it. I ate it up. I did it every time I could. And so I would, I would go and I'd be angels for other clubs. And the way they treat their class members is horrible. The way they treat their new dancers is like their second class, that they're not quite the club members, but if you stick around for four more months, then you have the opportunity to be one of us. And I think that's horrible. So when you go back to your club, how are you treating the people once they get in? Are you saying, oh, from seven to eight, we'll, we'll dance with you and maybe we can find enough people but then at 8 o'clock, it's your turn to get off so that the club can dance. Make sure that they feel like they're a part of the club. One thing that's really frustrating, and I'm a teenager, so I like to do it, but you might have to spend money to get new dancers in. And I'm good at spending the money. Um, but what, what I don't understand is that clubs will, will sit uh, and they'll hold that pocketbook, and they don't want to do anything for advertisement. But if you look at in the long run, what advertising can do. When they got my family in, they got me and my brother, my brother's girlfriend, my parents, and my grandmother in there. So then with the five of us going to dances, think of how much money that generated. Being part of, being members of the club, going to festivals. So if you spend a little money, it will come back in the long run. I guess that's all I had to say. Yeah, there you go. Very good, Justin. Thank you. Very good. I, I want some of it. How many of you saw the dance demonstration last night? Tremendous. I mean, compared to it, it's, it was quite a bit faster than what we commonly dance to today. I, I, I've been accused at times of being a fast caller, and I thought, boy, I wasn't touching that. And that's how we used to dance all the time. I think there, that's, that's a major thing about it. Our, our dancing slowed a little bit. I wonder if that has some kind of an impact someplace. But interesting aside to that was, Justin, you came into Colorado Springs on what, Friday? Was it Friday? And they were missing one of their guys. So Justin got to learn all the routines or learn – quite a few routines, um, and then you jumped up there and danced last night. So <laughs> it was, we were sitting there and just kind of chatting and talking, and all of a sudden he took off his baseball cap and handed it to John Jones and stepped out and jumped on the floor and started dancing. I thought, man, whoa. <laughs> anyway, it was impressive. Very good, very good. I would like to open up this to questions and comments from you because I know that there's a lot of you that have comments and questions, and so we'd like to hear from you. State your name, and let's go ahead and, and talk a little bit. I'm Ted Hughes. Um, I'm registered from Florida, but come from New England, Massachusetts predominantly. Um, I was in New Hampshire last year, and I was at a dance, and you were talking about the types of clothing. Uh, there was a gentleman there who was, in fact, wearing a skirt at, at a dance. Now, I'll qualify that by saying he was wearing a kilt, and he... He and I struck up a conversation, and he said he does like skirts, and 
and uh, he knows who he is and what he's not. But <laughs> but uh, he does like skirts. He likes to wear the skirt to the dance, and his partner was perfectly comfortable with that. And the other comment that I have is at the Florida State Fair this past year, um, we do a, an all-day dance. It's kind of a demo for the onlookers who want to... Uh, who are interested in square dancing because they see it and they think it's all yeehaw. And when it was my turn to do the tip, I started by putting on summer sounds and watching to see how many people would come up. And um, there weren't too many. So I took the record off and I put on Amos Moses. I had a good turnout with Amos Moses. So it, you, the type of music that you use certainly has an effect on people who do not dance. I'm just going to I'm going to interject while Roy runs the microphone showing my age but when Justin was talking about the beat, Aaron wants it. When Justin was talking about the beat, I passed a note to Mike it says it's got a good beat. It's easy to dance to. I'll give it an 85. <laughs> who remembers Dick Clark? That's what they always said when they rated the music. It's very true. It's that music will talk to them and, and get them up. Yes. Oh, I'm Erin Byers. I'm from California. And some of you have heard the story, but I'm going to tell it for the, for the benefit of the people who haven't. Um, when Christy brought that list of singing calls, and it is very, very true. We work with a lot of young people, and they do like a variety of music, but they don't always like it until after they get involved in square dancing. Once they start square dancing, their mind kind of opens up and they are more open to different kinds of music. About a year and a half ago, uh, my husband did a demo at a middle school in downtown Sacramento. And we're talking downtown, you know, not quite ghetto, but these are definitely kids who are not country in any way. And we had a demonstration square of older people. We had one teenager. Um, and they did a little dancing, and then Scott said, okay, you know, how many of you would like to try it? And he put on some really very modern techno-type music. We had a little tiny roped-off space, and they, we crammed four squares of kids who had never danced before into this little tiny space. And they were lov- and there were all kinds of other activities that they could do. You know, they could have – they were free food they could have, and they still came to dance. Well – we said, okay, let's do another demo tip. And he pulled out a Beatles song. However, the singing call had been countryfied. And all those kids just drifted away. So as soon as that little demo part was over, he put on some more modern music, and they all came back, just crowded around. So part of what we need to do is to look at what is our goal for this particular demonstration or exhibition, as Justin was talking about, and say, okay, if we're targeting kids, this is what we want to show them to get them interested. And once you get them hooked, then their mind, you know, it's easier to introduce them to other kinds of music, and most of the time they like it then. But you got to get their interest first. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. There, that, that's a big part is just getting their attention. I think once people begin moving, physically moving to music, that beat and, that, and, that, and they open up to different types of music. I couldn't agree more with you. I would use for a school school presentation just because it's not what they expect. Okay. Um, you know. What was it? It's Mamba Five. And if you I, I have the list on my computer printout of what it's a square dance record. None of these are, are things that I've edited. I am not that it's available. I am not that I am not that technologically adept. I keep working at it, but I also seem to be busy. Uh I'm, when I first got it, I have a high school gig that I've done for about five years in a row now, and they brought me in to teach all the phys ed classes. And when I first got this gig, I said, I need some music that will get their attention. And this poor kid, the first time I did it, I think I gave him whiplash because he turned when the music came on and looked at me so fast, I was sure he hurt his neck. You ready here? Okay, two... 
And I had that sucker cranked. And that's that's the Tush Hoedown. I don't know if it's available anymore, but it was after a ZZ Top song about going downtown and getting some Tush, which <clears throat> we we will explain to you later if you don't understand that term. <laughs> I'll explain to you later. I, I want a chaperone when I explain to Justin. Now, to add to this story, I heard a comment over here about older people like the beat, too. I was subbing for Mike Jacobs at a program at a senior town, uh, you know, a, a limited basic program. And I was talking to the people about the school, school thing because I, <clears throat> I had just finished it or I was just preparing for it. So I, I was chatting with them about that. And I said, i show you some of the music I play for them, but you probably wouldn't want to dance to it. And I put it on, and then one lady went, yeah, that's pretty neat. You, I, let's do that the next tip. So they danced to the Tush Hoedown, this group of folks in their 60s or so, and the lady came up to me. She said, "She's yeah, 60, 70, 80. Well, they were in a senior town. 60 is a lower age limit. I understand, but I'm, I'm giving a range. But the point being, the lady came up to me. She said, I want you to write down the name of the music and what the group was that you said did it originally so I can tell my grandson what I square danced to. (laughs) So there's another way to reach the public. Comment? comment? Um, My name is Hunter Keller. I'm from Montana. And I've often been ridiculed for wearing a hat to either dances. And it's usually a cowboy hat, you know, and it's not beat up or anything it's really nice and um, I've often had dancers come up and say why are you wearing that hat don't you know it's very very uncouth and my response to them is you have to open up to the younger crowd because if you don't you're going to chase them all away and you're not going to have any dancers to come back out to these dances and I started a club um, a while ago and they just had a beginner's class and we had an older caller come in and uh, dance with them and there was a gentleman wearing a cowboy hat, and he asked him to take it off. And I went up to the caller afterwards. I said, would you, you know, mind not doing that? I said, if he doesn't come back, I'm not going to be a happy person. And I talked to the gentleman afterwards. I said, you know, if you feel the need to wear a hat, go ahead and do so. And I said, this club's pretty lax. You know, I don't know if anybody else has had that problems, but I, that's one of the problems I'm running into. You know, it's interesting. That discussion has been on the callers forum several times before over the years. And, and there's, there's, I've heard the comments about uh, it can be dangerous. You in swinging or passing by somebody, you can catch them in the forehead or the eye, or you can, you know, that it can be an issue. Um, it's interesting. It, it, it re, I was. Probably about 25 years ago, I was in Bob Osgood's private office and just walking around and seeing photographs of square dancers over the years. And one of the things that caught my eye was a square dance in 1932, and every man on the floor was wearing a hat. It was a different kind of hat, not a cowboy hat, but everybody, because that was common at that time, men wore hats. And now this happened to be outside, and there's also the outside, you should wear your hat outside and not inside issue, there's that issue too. But it's interesting, and it was interesting as I walked around that room that I saw how square dancing attire had changed since the 30s and into the 40s and into the 50s and the 60s. And when Bob came back in the office, I said, Bob, let's walk back through this. You just got to help me out here. And we talked about, he said, square dancing attire has always evolved with the attire on the outside. What people wear outside, what they're comfortable in. The guys were wearing these kind of pants because they wore those kind of pants back then. And just regular loafers, penny loafers is what they wore back then. The cowboys weren't it wasn't a big deal back in the 30s, but as, as cowboys became more popular, as cowboys became our heroes, as cowboy movies and television programs, you know, all of a sudden we were wearing cowboy attire, and, and it became very Western. Western music became a lot more popular, and, and so he said it's interesting the way that we've, we've come along. He said the interesting thing about it is about this time in 1960-something or other, square dancing started ma- square dancers started manufacturing their own clothes 
for the first time for profit. As a matter of fact, before that time, all the women sewed all the clothes and they, they bought the clothes that were available. But when Square Dancers began manufacturing their own clothes, it froze our Square Dance style. And where, and where were the hemlines? <clears throat> well, it's interesting. The, the hemlines and some of those things followed the outside styles. You're absolutely right. And the hemlines, Beck, in, the 60s went, the hemlines in the 60s went up. And the manufacturers manufactured square dance clothes with the shorter skirts because hemlines were at that point higher. Now, luckily, they didn't manufacture them quite as short as I was wearing them, but <laughs> but the point being, when they manufactured them, they froze them at the higher level, and they'd never, they never until recently they never came back down. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, but now we're getting to a point where there's not as many square dance manufacturers. We may see our attire evolve again. Norm? Yeah, I'm Norm Wilcox from um, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Uh, two things. Uh, I totally agree with what Betty, Betsy said about the programs that we're teaching uh, new dancers. Uh, commitment is, is a big thing that people do not want to commit 30 weeks um, we need to emphasize the introduction and maintenance of uh, b basic programs that contain very few basics that can be learned in a very short period of time. And she mentioned the ABC program, and I think that's one of the ones that is, is very successful. Um, so we need to focus on this. It also means a lot of work on our part to learn how to call these dances. We, we're not used to calling mainstream dances with six or nine calls. Now we've got to call a dance for people with only maybe 10 or 12 calls. So that's one point. The other point I'd like to make is that I'm wondering how we are impacting people with the cost of our activity. Um, two little things. We started a class a few years ago back when uh, the average price of a dance was $8 a couple. Uh, this gentleman came out to the desk and said to Wendy, my wife, he says, how much? She said, $8. He hauls out his wallet, takes out a 10, a 5, and a 1. He figures 8 bucks a person. And they're quite willing to pay for the activity. They're willing to pay good money. Uh, as an aside to that, I also belong to a, a seniors bowling league. Uh, you have to be 55 or older. I'm not going to tell you how much older I am, but um, I qualify. And we pay $8 a person to bowl. And uh, apart from the social aspect of our bowling, the activity is only 20% of the time we're there, we're actually bowling. We have a team of five, divide that, the time by five, that's 20%. You dance a square dance, and you dance 15 minutes, sit for five, that's what, 75%? So the activity level is way higher for uh, the amount of money you're spending. So that's something to think about. Absolutely, Nora, I couldn't agree more. Uh, this goes back to something that, that Hunter said, and I think uh, every teenager kind of feels this way. Uh, I've been ridiculed a lot um, when it comes to calling um, what I wear to dances and what's appropriate. I love my uh, University of Memphis Tiger baseball cap, and I wear it everywhere. Um, dancers don't like that. Uh, they don't like the jeans that I wore because it's stylish for teenagers to wear uh, holy jeans. Yeah, and, and that's what I wear. And, and so when you're going to ridicule teenagers, you, you're not going to get them back. And so when you, when you say to somebody, well, we don't want you to be here, they're going to go out and they're going to tell their friends, oh, I was at this dance or I was ridiculed, and, and they're going to have a negative image and a negative impact. When we were at the national convention, uh, Christina Moreland uh, is another youth caller, and we had an opportunity to do um, a panel on what youth really want. And it was interesting that there was, five, there was four of us that were doing this panel, and we met for breakfast that morning. And sitting around the table, we all had a negative story of how a dancer um, uh, pushed us around or, or didn't want to dance with us or asked us to leave. Uh, we have Ruth and, and Sarah is, uh, from California, and they have negative stories, too, of how dancers uh, don't treat them as equals. So... So, um, and, and not saying, especially dress code, not saying that what I was doing is right or, or wrong, but just really think about it and how you're going to impact other people. And they're going to go out and they're going to tell other people whether they like the activity or whether they really don't like the activity. So really think about that. <laughs> Don? Um, I have Don Beck from Massachusetts. I have... Um, couple of comments, one on something Justin said and one on something Betsy said. Um, Justin was talking about demos, and it actually, 
I've never really thought of it as one is putting on a demonstration and the other is recruiting dancers, and I like that breakdown. Um, on the recruiting dancer end, which is I've always thought of, one of the things that we're trying to do is get people interested in joining the group. And the average person watching has an awful lot of barriers to being able to relate to being up on the stage or wherever they are and being one of that group. One is being able to dance as precisely of, of this exercise of all the beautiful stuff they've done. One is being able to wear the costumes or get the costumes. And I think the best thing to do is to break down as many of those barriers as possible so people can relate to it. So I generally emphasize no square dance attire. That kills one of the barriers. Um, another one is I've had dancers all, you know, what if I make a mistake? I said, don't worry about it. I want you to make mistakes. I don't want you to do them intentionally, but I'm going to push your limits so you'll probably make one. Don't be embarrassed. Because I want the people watching to realize that we're not a precision team. It's okay to make mistakes. We're having fun trying to keep and work with our own level. So, And there are probably other things you can think of, to, barriers to break down, that will help people be able to put themselves in the picture on the stage rather than being turned off of, you know, this is fun to watch, but I don't think I could ever do it. The other comment... I'd, I'd like to make on Betsy's, and, and she was talking about dress code. Betsy knows, and, and some others, that I've really had a hard time with dress code for at least 30 years. It's not a new thing with me. Um, I had a revelation, a weird thing go through my mind a day or two ago as I was driving down the street and saw some guy on a bicycle driving by. There are many different activities. This is, I, I'm not pushing this, but it's food for thought. <laughs> yeah, each activity has evolved its own outfit, its own costume. And this guy wearing spandex of, you know, tight clothing, fancy stripes, bright colors, and, you know, he could, he could pull up to a coffee shop and walk in and nobody would say anything about the funny outfit he had. I wouldn't wear it either. You know, I can't relate to that. I can drive a bike without it. Um, but, you know, and bowlers wear funny shoes and, and the whole bit. There's food for thought about maybe people can learn to accept some degree of Western outfit because they know you grow into that, that it's particularly functional for the activity. Now, I'm not sure what we wear is functional, but it's, it's food for thought. Thank you. Listen, we're going to wind this up a little bit because it's, it's lunchtime. And, uh, but we'd, so we're going to have just a couple more comments, and then we'll close up. Darlene Busen, I'm a caller partner out of Mesa, Arizona, originally from Southern California. And I know a lot of you are busy on Friday nights, but there's a show called Monk on Friday nights. Many of you may have seen the show Mr. Monk Goes to a Square Dance. It perpetuated every stereotype you could imagine about square dancing. It was held on a pig farm with the live fiddle and banjo, with the callers shouting out calls, no microphone, and as I say, every stereotype you could imagine. I want to pose the question, what could that caller have done to possibly change the producer's mind? Could the dancers have possibly changed the producer's mind about what square dancing is? Can we, in any way, without... Um, some of us may have influences on studios or something like that, to, to actually get out what real square dancing is instead of perpetuating the stereo image. Very good. Pam, one more. You know, it's true that, that, that um, we even had an issue just recently where we had advertised on the Internet to a group of, it was a service club. We had their email addresses. I had done a one-night party for them. We invited them to come out and join us for square dancing for just a one, another one-night party. And we got a lot of RSVPs back that said, no, they didn't want to join us for square dancing because they did that. As, although we, we, we had just did a one-night stand with them. And, and so we took the same email list, list and, and just changed square dancing to team dancing. And 60 of them came to our night. <laughs> These are the same people that said, so I, there's an issue, maybe there's an issue about name. People equate our name with a certain style of dancing. Yes. Just very quick. Uh, followed when Justin was talking, oh, sorry, Pam Clasper from Toronto. Um, when Justin was talking about um, being sent away and negative comments, uh, market researchers have found that if somebody likes something, they'll tell one or two people. If they don't like it, they'll tell over 10 people. Exactly, Pam. Being more tolerant is a huge part of what is what 
brings people to our activity or what can bring them into our activity or drive them away. You know, I want to thank you for coming out. There are some great sessions on one-night parties at this uh, convention. There's also another session on the Program Policy Initiative, which is about different experimental programs, um, programs bringing people into the activity. Look at those uh, programs and, and consider attending. I want to thank Betsy Ghana and Justin Russell for their help. Thank you guys for attending. Have a great convention. Have a great lunch. <laughs>